Good morning, and thank you for attending our webinar this morning. The topic today is EMV, especially in light of the October 1, 2015 initial liability shift for indoors. Next slide, please. My name is Linda Tose, and I'm Director of Standards for Conexus. We also have today with us Mark Carl, who is the CEO of EchoSat, and he's going to be our moderator. And then we have Christy Kewen from Heartland Payment Systems, who will be doing the main presentation. A couple of housekeeping notes. The webinar is being recorded. It will be posted in about 10 days on our YouTube channel. You can find it youtube.com backslash Conexus online. It will also be linked from our website, which is connexus.org. The slide deck will be available for you. In about two hours, you will receive an email, and in there will be a link to a survey. It's a very short six-question survey, and if you answer that, and when you hit submit, at the very end, you'll be provided with the presentation. All of the participants today are on mute. So if you want to ask any questions, please do so in your GoToWebinar user interface. There's a questions section that you can expand, and you type in your questions right there. Um, you don't have to wait until the end to ask questions. Go ahead and type those in as they come up. And then at the end, Christy and her team will go through those questions and try to answer as many as they can. Uh, please don't ask vendor-specific questions. They won't be able to answer anything about vendors' timelines or pricing or anything like that. If your question doesn't get answered today or you have other questions that come up, you can always email us at info at .org and we can route those to the appropriate people. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Conexus. Conexus is an independent, not-for-profit organization. We are closely aligned with NACS on several projects, but we are a standalone independent organization. We have quite a few volunteers who do the heavy lifting. We have just a couple of staff members. It's, it's really the volunteers who do the work. We do set standards for various um, pieces for data exchange, in security, and payments. We provide clarity to the industry by identifying emerging technology and trends and also educating the industry on topics that are important for the industry. We advocate for our industry by participating in other organizations that do open standards, and we um, try to do innovation and competition. We advocate for that because we feel like that's what makes for a better standard in the long run. And the bottom line is we, we improve profitability. I'd also like to show you that we have an annual conference coming up. If you could go to the next slide. Um, the dates for that are May 1 through 5, and it's the Lowe's Ventana Canyon in Tucson, Arizona. The registration is open at connexus.org backslash annual conference. This is a beautiful resort destination where we get together and we have educational sessions on a variety of topics. We have a keynote speaker in Michael Rogers, who's a futurist. And also our committees get together and do committee work to advance standards and education pieces. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, and that's Mark Carl, who is the CEO of EchoSat. Prior to becoming the CEO, Mark served as EchoSat's CTO and developed a number of transaction security platforms, now more than 21,000 students across the U.S., and transport more than 12% of all petroleum transactions. Mark actively promotes data security within the petroleum market. He serves as the vice chair of the Conexus Data Security Standards Committee, and he's a member of the Petroleum Working Group within the EMV Migration Forum. So Mark, all yours. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar. Um, as Linda said, my name is Mark Carl. I'm the CEO at ECOSAT also the vice chair of the Data Security Standards Committee at Conexus. Our chair is Cara Gunderson of Sego Petroleum, and Cara couldn't be with us today, so she asked me to sit in here and moderate. So I'd like to share a little bit about um, our Data Security, Data, Data Security Standards Committee and, and uh, what we do within Conexus. Uh, first, we focus on site-level uh, security. We try to clarify mandates, PCI DSS requirements, law, 
and emerging methods of risk reduction for our industry. We create standards and best practices for the petroleum and sea store industry and relevant programs that assist in the implementation of standards to achieve data security and compliance. We advocate for meaningful, cost-effective definitions of data security, and we promote these monthly webinars on key topics surrounding data security for the benefit of our stakeholders. So if any of you on the webinar today are interested in assisting with the Data Security Standards Committee, please feel free to reach out to myself or Carl Gunderson or any of the Connexus staff assisting with the webinar today. And with that, I will hand it over to Christy for today's webinar. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to Connexus for inviting me to this webinar today and to all of you for attending. I'm the Vice President of Compliance at Heartland, and my team is the Strategic Hub for EMB here at Heartland. And today we're going to look at EMB and an overview of what EMB is, talk through some timelines, look at some EMB numbers, talk about considerations for EMB, and then review what the liability shift means. What is EMB? EMB Co. stands for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, and it's a standards body that is owned and operated by the major card brands, MasterCard, UnionPay, JCB, American Express, Discover, and Visa. The goal of this body is to create a global payment standard, something that can be used across the world and allow consumers to have a consistent experience when using their credit and debit cards. Another goal of EMB is to improve security and to decrease fraud, specifically lost and stolen or counterfeit fraud. Note that EMV is not a breach warranty and it is not intended to prevent all breaches. We'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. EMV also can be a building block for future technology. You'll hear terms like NFC, mobile, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, all can be built upon EMV. There are a lot of things that EMB is not. EMB is not mandated nor required. It is not a law. No matter what you've heard, it is a merchant's choice to implement EMB or not. There are some ramifications for not implementing EMB, and we'll go through those when we look at the liability shift slides. EMB also is not protection against all chargebacks. EMB is specifically related to lost and stolen and counterfeit chargebacks. EMB also does not secure cardholder data. It does not encrypt card numbers, nor does it protect the data as it's being transmitted or stored. EMB also is not equal to PCI. EMB protects against fraud, as I said earlier, specifically counterfeit and lost and stolen fraud, whereas PCI is focused on security of the data. So why do EMB? Well, it all has to do with that microprocessor that is starting to appear on all of our debit and credit cards. The little chip, no matter what you call it, EMB, chip and pin, chip and signature, a chip card, a smart card, all is referring to the same thing. That little chip that's appearing on the card that is in fact a microprocessor and allows the card to communicate to the point of sale terminal and generate dynamic data for every transaction. This is better than MagStripe because on MagStripe the data is static, it doesn't change, it's not dynamic, and therefore it can be easily duplicated or stolen. Whereas with EMB, the chip is a microprocessor, it creates that dynamic data, and that data is difficult to duplicate and still makes it more expensive and less appealing to crooks who may want to try to take that data. In the United States, this chart represents the timelines to get us to EMV. The United States is the only developed country to implement EMV without a government mandate to do so. Not that it's been easy. It's taken a lot of work from a lot of different parties across the industry, whether from processors, card brands, merchants, point of sale vendors, all the interested parties have participated in EMV discussion in the United States to come up with a solution that could work across our industry. The important dates here are the October 1, 2005 non-AFD, or Automated Fuel Dispenser, liability shift that went in last year, and then in October 2017, an additional liability shift specifically for those automated fuel dispensers. 
the car brands recognize that the amount of work and development and installation time for automated fuel dispensers was longer, and therefore those liability dates are different. So let's talk about the numbers. These are numbers that were provided by MasterCard and Visa. Some of you may have previously heard numbers that said that at the end of 2015, 60% of credit cards and 40% of debit cards would be EMV or have a chip by the end of 2015. Well, by looking at these numbers, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. And really the message here is that everything is increasing. The number of chip cards in the market is increasing, whether credit or debit. The number of cards being used by consumers is increasing. And the number of merchants who support EMV or have an EMV terminal that can take an EMV card is also increasing. And I think all parties expect that to continue. As I said, EMV is growing everywhere. This is a short list of issuers and merchants that are now accepting or issuing EMV cards. This list is small. There are many others that we could have added to this list, and the list is growing each and every day. Many of you probably have at least one chip card already today. You may even have a debit card that has a chip on it now. And if you don't, you will very soon. Most issuers are issuing chip cards when they renew a card when it expires. They will also issue a chip card if a consumer calls and requests one. And most merchants are starting, if they haven't already, to evaluate their need for EMB. So when talking about EMV, the main concern is at the point of sale. Things to consider at the point of sale include the cardholder verification method. How will you verify that the cardholder is who they say they are? There are a couple of options, and you can support one or all of these. And there are liability impacts depending on which verification method you do choose to support. The verification methods include PIN, signature, and no signature, which can also be called no CVM, and is typically used at quick service restaurants. Also, there's a decision to be made as to whether or not to support contactless, or NFC, which stands for Near Field Communication. The decision here is about speed of service. Do you need to get people through the line quickly? And do you serve customers that might want to use mobile pay? Would they want to use things like Apple Pay, pay with their cell phones, or other new technologies that may be coming? We'll talk more about each of these in a moment. So cardholder verification methods. As I said, you can support a variety of things, including PIN, signature, or no CVM. With PIN, there's two options, online PIN. And this is where the consumer enters their PIN number at the point of sale. It's encrypted and sent in the authorization message to the issuer for them to verify that the PIN is the correct PIN. This CVM method offers security, but it does require that a point of sale have a PIN pad to support the entering of the PIN. Offline PIN is a little bit different because the PIN actually doesn't go to the issuer. It is verified between the chip on the card and the terminal itself. Again, this offers security, but it requires even more support at the terminal for PIN pads, for PINs to be entered at the PIN pad, and then also requires keys in order to make that conversation happen between the terminal and the chip on the card. Offline the PIN is not supported by Visa and probably won't be widely used in the United States. Signature is what we're all used to, where you sign the receipt, you hand it back to the clerk. They may or may not compare it to the signature on your card. It's simple to implement, but it's also less secure, because if you sign Mickey Mouse, it may or may not be noticed. And then no CVM is, again, where there's no cardholder verification. This is generally used when it's a small transaction amount, say $5 or $10 or $50. It allows for speed, but it can't be used if you're making a large purchase. Typically, the issuer will decide what the card will support. When they issue you your card, they'll decide whether you would need to enter a PIN or whether signature is OK or whether they'll give an option of either one. As a merchant, a terminal can decide which CVMs the terminal will support. And you'll need to talk to your point of sale vendor about what CVMs your EMV terminal may or may not support. 
when we get to liability shifts, this will be very important because the security at the terminal and the security at the card ultimately, in some cases, will determine who is liable when there's fraud. Then we talk about authorization methods. Authorization online or offline and are basically to validate that the card is a good card and that there's money available either on the credit line or in the bank account in order to support the transaction. If a transaction is authorized online, then there's a message that's sent to the issuer in real time and the issuer can approve or decline the transaction. This is what most of us are used to today. Offline allows the card and the point of sale again to communicate directly and to never send anything online to the issuer to look at. This normally occurs when there's a problem with connectivity. In the United States, because we have such broad methods of communication, we have dial and we have satellite and we have IP, we have various ways to communicate, we typically see online only and offline becomes more and more rare as technology and communication improves. Contact versus contactless. Contact is just what it sounds like. You take a card with a chip on it, you insert it into the terminal, it makes contact with the terminal, and it remains there for the life of the transaction. Contactless, on the other hand, never actually is inserted into the terminal. You tap a card or a device, like a cell phone, near the terminal. It's a faster transaction, and it avoids the issue of cards being left in the terminal. Hopefully this will just be a short-term concern and consumers will learn not to leave their cards in the terminal over time. Contactless also allows for mobile. Things like Apple Pay are based on contactless. However, it is more costly for an issuer to issue a card that supports contactless. And it's unknown how many issuers will actually issue a card that supports contactless, especially when many consumers are moving to Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and other technically advanced ways to pay, we may just see issuers issue standard cards, assuming that all of us will pit it in our phones and go to mobile applications. So now let's talk about the liability shift. There is no mandate, again, for merchants to implement EMV. It is a merchant's choice. However, liability shift could equal potential chargebacks. And generally, the party that's least secure is going to be the one that's liable for fraud, lost, stolen, and counterfeit. So let's talk about counterfeit first. Counterfeit liability is the same for all four card brands, American Express, Discover, MasterCard, and Visa. Before October of 2015, if a MagStripe card was presented at a MagStripe terminal, the issuer was liable for counterfeit fraud. This has not changed. The issuer remains liable. However, um, when a MagStripe card is presented at a chip terminal, the issuer is going to retain that liability because here the merchant has chosen to upgrade to EMV and is now more secure than the card that's presented, which is a MagStripe. If the situation is reversed, however, and a chip card is presented at a terminal that is still MagStripe, it has not upgraded to EMV, the merchant now becomes liable if that transaction turns into counterfeit fraud. If both the card and the terminal have the same technology, they both support chip, then the issuer remains liability. This applies for all brands and regardless of whether the terminal supports PIN or not. So as you can see, to summarize, liability for counterfeit fraud will shift from the issuer to the merchant if the merchant does not upgrade to EMV and they are presented with a chip card that turns out to have a counterfeit mag stripe. Now let's talk about lost or stolen. The rules here vary a little bit. American Express, Discover, and MasterCard have the same rules, but Visa has slightly different rules. So we'll cover Visa in just a moment. And you're going to see in the following slides that primarily the party that's least secure will obtain the liability. Let's talk about an attended environment first. This is a face-to-face -face transaction. Before October, a MagStripe card at a MagStripe terminal, the issuer was liable. This has not changed. 
if we have a MagStripe card at a chip terminal, the issuer is liable. Again, the merchant is more secure. They've upgraded to EMV. Therefore, the issuer is liable. However, if a chip and pin card is presented at a merchant who has not upgraded to EMB, they still have a MagStripe terminal, the merchant now becomes liable for lost or stolen fraud that happens in an attended environment. If a chip and signature card is presented at a MagStripe terminal, the issuer is liable. And I know this seems a little bit odd, but what this is leading to is that the issuer issued a card that supports chip and signature and chip and pin is considered the most secure method. So because the issuer did not go to the most secure method, they are still liable for lost or stolen fraud. If the situation is reversed and the card has chip and signature and the merchant has upgraded to chip and pin, the issuer is still liable because the merchant has upgraded to the highest level of security, chip and pin, and the issuer has not. Now you can see the chip and pin card is presented, but the merchant did not upgrade all the way to chip and pin. They only upgraded to chip and signature, and now the merchant is liable. So as I said earlier, the functionality at the point of sale can have ramifications on liability. If we have a situation where both the merchant and the card support the same level of security, they both support chip and pin, the issuer remains liable. So to summarize, a merchant can now be liable for lost or stolen if a chip and pin card is used at a terminal that is either MagStripe or chip and signature. Let's talk about unattended for a moment. Lost or stolen, still for American Express, Discover, and MasterCard. Before October, a MagStripe card at a MagStripe terminal, the merchant was liable. Again, this is unattended, could include a car wash, vending machine, laundry, or an AFD. This has not changed. Now we have on the third row a MagStripe card at a chip terminal. Now we're shifting liability to the issuer because the merchant has upgraded to new technology. If we have a chip card that's presented at a MagStripe terminal, a merchant who has not upgraded, the merchant becomes liable. Again, if we have a chip and signature card at a chip and pin terminal, which is more secure because they support pin, the issuer gets the liability. If we have a chip and pin card at a terminal that does not support chip and pin, the merchant has liability because they did not upgrade to the most secure method. And again, if both sides are equal, the issuer is liable because both support chip and pin. These are the rules that are in place today for an unattended terminal, a car wash, a vending, and a laundry, for example, and will be in place in October 2017 for an automated fuel dispenser. So again, to summarize, an issuer would receive liability for lost or stolen on American Express, Discover, and MasterCard if they use a card that is less secure at a chip terminal. As I mentioned, Visa has slightly different rules. We'll go through those now. For Visa in an unintended environment, it's pretty easy because the issuer is always liable. This again is, un is an attended environment face to face. The rules have not changed. The issuer has been liable in the past and they will be liable in the future regardless of the card or the terminal. So again, to summarize, a merchant's not liable for Visa for lost or stolen in an attended environment. This does change, however, when we talk about an unattended environment. Before October, the merchant was liable, and after October, the merchant remains liable in every case except for one. If we talk about a chip card at a chip terminal, then the issuer becomes liable. This is the only situation in an unattended environment for Visa where the issuer will be have liability for lost or stolen. Again, this is the rules that are currently in place for unattended, such as a car wash, a vending, a laundry, and will be in place in October of 2017 for AFD. So to summarize, issuer only receives liability for visa unattended, lost or stolen, if it's a chip card used at a chip terminal. So how do you get to a terminal? How do you get through certification? You've worked with your point of sale vendor, you're ready to roll out EMV, 
you have to go through a certification. And previously, we could do certifications between customers, equipment providers, and a processor. With EMV, the process has changed. First, your point of sale vendor needs to go through EMV Co. Level 1 or Level 2 approval. And those approvals are good for only four years. Please work with your point of sale vendor to make sure that any equipment that you buy has EMV Co. certification prior to any purchase. Once you have your equipment, you'll obtain your terminal software, and that entire package will go through an end-to-end -end certification between the provider, the processor, and each card brand. This does take additional time and cost because now we have to certify with each of the card brands, whereas before, as I said, it was only between the point-of-sale provider and the processor. There has been significant work done in the industry between card brands and various acquirers and processors to try to streamline terminal certification. And those are headed in the right direction, and I expect those conversations to continue. When we talk about EMV, as I mentioned earlier, EMV is not the solution to all security and fraud issues. EMV does help with authentication, and it helps to prevent counterfeit, lost, or stolen fraud. However, it does not encrypt information, and it does not help with the security of information as it's stored. In order to do that, you need to also have encryption and tokenization. At Heartland, it's what we call Heartland Secure. We recommend any conversations about upgrading to new technology include a conversation not only about EMV, but also about encryption to protect the data as it's being transmitted, and then also around tokenization to protect data as it sits at rest. So what process adjustments need to be done with EMV. First is staff training. Staff will need to understand how to process a chip card. They will need to understand that the card needs to be inserted, and they will need to understand how to insert the card with the chip first. They will also need to understand that they have to leave the card there for the entire time of the transaction. Staff will also need to understand what the verification methods are that you support. Will you need a customer-facing pin pad? Staff and stores will also need to help with cardholder training, because regardless of what information the card brands or the issuing banks have sent out, the actual training on how to use an EMV card is going to happen when people are at merchant locations attempting to use their card for a purchase. So clerks and staff are going to have to understand if the card should be tapped, swiped, or inserted. They're going to have to help consumers not forget their cards in the terminal, and we suggest that each terminal have some type of flashing terminal message or a beep to remind the customer to listen and to remind them when to take their card out. And we're going to have to all work through consumer confusion and mistrust. Consumers are confused. They don't understand the difference between MagStripe and Chip. They don't understand when to insert, when to swipe, when to tap. They don't understand when they can use their cell phones and when they cannot. And they have lots of mistrust. The chip is new. Some think it has information about them more so than just the information needed to complete the transaction. And we've even heard stories of people attempting to remove the chips from their cards. And then there's the additional time per transaction. EMV transactions do take a bit longer because of the conversation that needs to occur between the chip on the card and the terminal. We've seen on average 7 to 10 seconds longer. But regardless of the actual time that it takes, the cardholders have perceptions that the transaction takes longer simply because they have to insert the card into the terminal and leave it there for the entire time of the transaction. Gone are the days where you swipe your card and put it away while the cashier continues to ring up your groceries. Wanted to spend a couple minutes to talk about fallback. And fallback in an EMV world is a indication that there's some type of problem either with the chip card or the point of sale terminal. That means the chip cannot be read and cannot be used for the transaction. So the transaction falls back to MagStripe. <coughs> Issuers and card brands are monitoring EMV fallback. And over time, they may implement fines where there are high fallback volumes. And issuers may start to decline fallback because they've issued a card that has a chip and they want the chip to be used whenever possible. As this illustration shows, it is risky to take a card and attempt to process it with a the chip, then go to MagStripe 
have that not work, and then attempt to key enter. The likelihood of a single card having a problem with both the chip and the mag stripe on one transaction is probably rare. And if that were to occur, merchants should identify that as a potential high-risk transaction and consider alternatives. So what things are in discussion as far as EMV? The industry is talking to fleet companies about EMV and their plans to support chip cards going forward. This includes Visa and MasterCard fleet, Ride Express, Voyager, and others. There is a lot of additional data that is sent with a fleet transaction, such as a driver ID or a odometer, and those fields need to be considered in the EMV chip data that is sent. Those conversations will be continuing. There's also conversations about pin bypass, and this is the capability where um, perhaps the consumer doesn't know their pin, or for some reason they elect not to enter their pin at the point of sale. It allows issuers to understand that the PIN was asked for and the consumer, for whatever reason, did not enter the PIN, and the issuer then has the discretion to approve or decline the transaction. Over time, we will see issuers start to decline more often, especially if the consumer has shown that they know their PIN at other transactions. So for example, I go and I buy a hamburger, I use my EMV card with my PIN, but then later I go to an electronics store, I buy a couple hundred dollars worth of electronics, and I choose to bypass the PIN. My issuer may see that as a risky transaction because I've shown previously that I do know my PIN and the issuer may wonder why I've chosen not to enter it now. They may see that as risky and decide to decline my transaction at the electronics store. There are also discussions about the end of life for MagStripe. Now to be clear, don't expect that to be any time in the near future. However, there are conversations that at some point we need to move away from having mag stripes on our cards. It will take time, obviously, for merchants to all upgrade to EMV terminals and for all cards to support chip. But over time, this is a conversation that at some point we need to identify when mag stripe is end of life. So next steps. Merchants should monitor industry news. There's a lot of news about EMV. Um, I would say take some of it with a grain of salt and, and just make sure that the source that you're receiving the news from is a newsworthy source, because um, especially around October 1st, there was a lot of news coverage about EMV and chip cards, and not all of it, of course, was accurate. Then seek education and updates from a trust advisor. That may be your processor or your acquirer. It may be your point of sale vendor. Um, also, various industry, industry and associations similar to Conexus. There is also a website that is uh, maintained by the EMV Migration Forum, which is gochipcard.com. It's a good source of information. And then evaluate your environment. Have you upgraded to EMV already? And if not, what does it take to upgrade your point of sale? What is the cost? Where are your locations? Are they in areas where there's typically high fraud or not? And what have your chargeback ratios been in the past? Another important thing to consider is competitive landscape. What are your competitors doing? You don't want to be the last guy on the block to do EMV and risk having your competitors hang up signs indicating that they are secure and that you are not. And then also consider budget. No point of sale upgrades happen without cost, and that's including EMV. So if you haven't already budgeted for EMV, need to start thinking about what that might look like, what your timeline is, and ensure that the budget is accounted for. So now we'll take any questions. If you have questions, you can type them in on your GoToWebinar question section, and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can. So somebody asked if they could request a PIN for their chip card, um, and that they have a chip card, but they had never received a PIN. And that's a conversation that they need to have with their issuer. Uh, it all depends on what your issuer is supporting. If your issuer is supporting PIN, um, then when you contact them, they will let you know that and send you your PIN. If they are not supporting PIN, uh, then they will let you know that when you use your card, you'll need to sign for the card, uh, for the transaction. So it depends, and it will vary issuer to issuer. 
Um, there's not a standard that says all issuers will have a pen or will not. And then somebody else did ask what is EMV, um, and that was asked early on, so hopefully uh, we covered that, but just in case we didn't, uh, EMV again stands for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, and it is a standards body that is owned and operated by the major card brands to set up the EMV standards so that we can all implement EMV across the world in a concise manner. So somebody asked, how does EMV work with online purchases? And EMV um, today doesn't really impact online. And when you go, obviously, to make an online purchase, um, you enter in your information. And it doesn't matter if that card is a chip card or not. However, one thing we do anticipate happening is that as more and more face-to-face -face merchants support EMV, we expect fraud to move more and more online. So you will start to probably see more and more enhancements to online merchants as they try to combat fraud as well. Uh, somebody asked if there is an EMV chip card and PIN, why need PCI as data doesn't go to the point of sale? Um, so even if the card is chip and PIN, it's still going through the point of sale and still going through as an authorization to the issuer of that card. The issuer is, in most cases, validating whether the PIN is valid or not. And so there's still transaction data available, um, which, when it's being transmitted between the point of sale, the processor, and the issuer, that information could still be made available to a fraudster. If somebody tried to hack in and obtain that information, they still could. The information is in the clear when it's transmitted. And, and so they could still obtain that information, which is why PCI is needed to ensure that that data is not made available, either resting in somebody's database, resting on the point of sale, uh, so that somebody couldn't hack in and obtain that information. So again, remember, PCI is a way to secure the data, whereas EMV is a way to validate that the chip and the consumer are who they say they are. That's why both are needed. Somebody asked if an EMV card is swiped at a EMV-ready terminal. Does the terminal reject the swipe and require the customer to dip the card? Yes, it should. Um, there is actually a code on an EMV card um, that identifies, even in the MagStripe, that the card is capable of EMV and has a chip. So if you swipe it in a terminal that supports chip, it will identify that code and identify that the card is a chip card and ask that the card be dipped or inserted so that it can be done as a chip card instead. Give me a moment while we read through a couple more of the questions. So somebody asked about they upgraded to new um, equipment and that the equipment supports CHIP, but that the software hasn't been provided. And so therefore, where does the liability fall? Um, and so the liability, um, if it's an AFD terminal, that liability shift is not until October of 2017. However, if it's an inside terminal face-to-face, -face, then the liability there would rest with the merchant, um, regardless of whether the terminal hasn't been upgraded because the merchant has chosen not to upgrade it or because equipment or software is not available. That doesn't change the liability. Somebody asked about the status of compromises of EMV cards and can they be spoofed? Um, so there are rumors, at least, that EMV cards um, can be compromised. Um, however, it's much more difficult than a mag stripe, and so the security is much increased. I will never say that it couldn't happen or won't happen. Uh, all things are possible, and I think we all recognize that the crooks are usually a step ahead. Um, but EMV is an attempt to uh, you know, get a little bit ahead, at least, and give them a run for their money. And again, somebody asked who is liable for fraudulent chargebacks if the merchant's been waiting to obtain um, the software or the terminal. And again, the liability shift doesn't make considerations um, for whatever issues might be in the way of obtaining an EMV terminal. Uh, the liability shift is clear based on who is more secure, the issuer or the merchant. 
Uh, somebody did ask an estimate of cost for chip-enabled terminals, and unfortunately that's not something we can answer. Um, that's a conversation that needs to happen with your processor or your point-of-sale vendor because cost can vary based on a number of factors. Somebody also asked about four-court upgrades um, at the end of 2017 um, and about dealer av availability. Um, and that, too, is something that you'll need to talk to your point-of-sale vendor about. I think it's widely known that there are issues with dealer availability for installations, um, but that will vary from point-of-sale vendor to point-of-sale vendor. Uh, so you'll need to talk to your vendor about their availability for equipment and then also availability for installation. Um, somebody asked if they had a credit card um, in a face-to-face -face environment, do they still ask for ID to match the name? Um, if the customer is signing for the transaction, then absolutely. Um, and then based on a risk assessment, if you decide that the transaction is risky, uh, you always have the availability to ask for ID. Somebody asked if EMV is 100% safe for a merchant. Um, and I can go back to the liability shifts. Um, I would say that EMV is an increase in security for merchants over MagStripe, uh, which merchants support today. And it allows, in some cases, for merchants to shift liability to the issuer. Um, however, there are still ramifications in places where the merchant would be liable, especially if they chose not to upgrade to EMV. Uh, give me a second, read through a couple more questions. One other good point on the question about EMV being 100% safe for a merchant. Um, merchants will still need to validate PCI compliance, because remember that EMV is not the same thing as PCI, and PCI requirements still apply for merchants, and so merchants will need to still continue their PCI compliance and ensure that they're not storing credit information at the point of sale or anywhere in their systems. Uh, and then somebody asked about level one and level two certifications and whether those are for the pin pad or the point of sale um, and whether or not the point of sale will actually see the um, credit card information that's processed. And that, again, depends on the solution that you um, have with your point of sale vendor. Um, there are some solutions where the point of sale um, itself is immune, if you will, from the transaction and the credit card information is sent to the processor outside of the point of sale. So the point of sale may say the transaction is $10 and then the credit card information is sent through, say, a pin pad to the processor and the point of sale never actually sees the credit card information that is passed. Um, there are other solutions, however, where that's not the case and the credit card information actually goes through the point of sale. So it depends on how the point of sale is set up. So have that conversation with your point of sale vendor and make sure that you understand the particular configuration that you're purchasing and whether or not your point of sale would be in scope for PCI and also understand from that point of sale vendor what level one and level two certifications from EMV are required for that configuration. Fortunately, there's not a one-size-fits-all right there. And somebody asked, how does EMV work with gas credit cards from the major brands? And I assume they're asking about proprietary um, cards. Um, and so today, the EMV implementation that we have seen have been for the major card brands, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express, JCB. Um, however, as we talked about fleet companies looking at EMV, I also anticipate that proprietary cards um, are looking at solutions there um, because eventually at some point we'll probably move away from MagStripe, so all cards will need to have a chip or some version of it in order to process. Um, however, implementations right now have been focused on the major card brands. Uh, somebody asked about financing available, and again, that's another question that we're not able to answer. That depends on the individual situation uh, with your point of sale vendor or your processor. And then somebody else asked if the point of sale is not processing EMV, is the point of sale out of scope for EMV cert? 
uh, level one and two. And correct, if the terminal is a MagStripe terminal only and does not support EMV in any way, then there's no need to get the EMV level one and level two certification. Just remember, support of a MagStripe terminal uh, will have liability ramifications. Somebody asked if during the transaction there is an issue with the power or there's some type of internet issue, uh, what happens? And so same thing uh, would happen as you have done on MagStripe. Um, if the transaction can be done offline, then that's a possibility if the card and the terminal both support offline authorization. Uh, if not, uh, when the power comes back up, you'll need to determine whether the transaction actually completed prior to the power issue or not, and if not, uh, reinitiate the transaction. Uh, somebody else asking about programming for software for EMV, um, and again, that is not a one-size-fits-all question. Uh, it depends on your point-of-sale vendor, who's providing the hardware, who's providing the software, and also working with your acquirer. Uh, best thing to do is to reach out to your point-of-sale vendor and your acquirer to ask them for their timelines. Uh, Mark, maybe a question that I'd ask you to help with. Somebody's asking about Conexus attempting to get standardization across different networks for different liability shifts. Uh, and all networks are involved with EMV, why differences in liability? I can answer the question about differences in liability. Uh, I think we see that pretty much in all standards across the card brands. They don't always do things exactly the right way, uh, exactly the same way among each brand. They have different timelines sometimes, different requirements, and that's the same with EMV. Um, they have different philosophies about EMV and um, who should be liable. You can see that with Visa. Obviously, they have different liability requirements for lost or stolen. Um, but Mark, I don't know if you can answer the question about Conexus working on standardization across the networks. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, within the uh, Petroleum Working Committee at the EMV Migration Forum, uh, there's been an effort to try to, <clears throat> to try to limit the number of certifications that have to be done by isolating particular certifications that are done with one acquirer that can be transferred to another acquirer. And um, I, I know there's been some, some progress on that. I, I don't know exactly where, where it's at or what the result's going to be, but uh, they are working on that uh, within the Petroleum Working Committee at, Connect, at uh, EMB Migration Forum. Christy, I'd also add that Connexus has spearheaded the effort to try to get a standard way of processing fleet cards for EMV, so we have been hosting that work um, in conjunction with the EMV Migration Forum Petro Working Group. So, I mean, Conexus is very involved in that group, and wherever we can standardize on different things, we have been, and, and clearly we're keeping a pulse on what's happening within that group. Great, thank you. And I would also add to that that as a processor acquirer, we have ongoing conversations with the card brands, and I would assume that all of our competitors, uh, other processors and acquirers do as well. Uh, and on behalf of our merchants, we're always asking the card brands to streamline and standardize. Um, they obviously, again, have their own reasonings for the rules that they come out with. Um, and because they're competitors to the card brands, it's not like they are able to get together and, and come up with standardized rules either. And somebody asked, if a chargeback happens, is there any stronger evidence that the buyer made the, made the purchase or not? Um, and so if the terminal supported a PIN and a PIN was actually entered, then yes, that's proof that the consumer was there and knew their PIN and entered their PIN. Uh, that's the strongest proof available uh, to dispute a transaction. If you do not have um, a PIN, um, you know, Defenses such as the transaction was authorized or um, you know, the transaction was signed for and the signature was matched, those in the EMV liability shift don't really matter. It all matters on the security of who had the stronger security in most cases. Somebody else asked, is unattended transaction with Stripe still the issuer's responsibility until October of 2017? If it's counterfeit, then it is the issuer. If it's lost or stolen fraud, then it's the merchant. Uh, and then somebody asked, 
it happens many times that debit is declined at the terminal, but the consumer is charged for the transaction. Um, and that does happen. That's not specifically re related to a MagStripe or an EMV transaction, um, but sometimes a debit transaction, because it's done online real time, um, there could be something that happens in the communication of that transaction, uh, and it appears to the terminal that no response was received or that the transaction was declined, but the issuer thinks the transaction went through. Typically, there are ways to adjust that transaction um, after the fact and to make the consumer whole. That's something to talk to your processor about as to what their specific procedures are uh, for a debit transaction and if the consumer is charged. Second, looking through the questions here. So somebody's saying, if MagStripe, if we sign the receipt for the chargeback, whose responsibility is that? So I think they're asking if they have a transaction that's MagStripe um, and they have a chargeback. So it would depend on what type of card and what type of terminal um, and what type of chargeback it is. So I put the liability um, slides back on the screen. I'm going to back up a little bit here, so bear with me just a second. Go back to the beginning of counterfeit and summarize that. So here we're looking at the summarization for counterfeit. The merchant was liable for counterfeit prior to October of 2015, and a merchant is still liable if it's a chip card that's presented at a magstrip terminal and it's a counterfeit fraud chargeback. And then for lost or stolen, as we talked about, the rules vary. Um, American Express, Discover, and MasterCard. Let me get to the summary page so I can show you that. So this is a summary page for an attended transaction face-to-face, -face, lost or stolen fraud. American Express, Discover, and MasterCard. If the transaction, the card, is on a chip and pin card at a MagStripe terminal, the merchant's liable. And also, if the card is a chip and pin card at a chip and signature terminal, the merchant's also liable. If it's an unattended terminal and it's lost or stolen for American Express, Discover, and MasterCard, then the issuer becomes liable if it's a chip terminal. In other cases, the merchant's liable if they still have a MagStripe terminal or they have a terminal that is chip and no pin. And then for Visa, again, in an attended environment for Visa, lost or stolen, the merchant's never liable. And then for unattended, went too far. For unattended for Visa, for lost or stolen, the merchant was liable before October, and the merchant remains liable except if there is a chip card at a chip terminal, then the issuer is liable. So somebody asked how the merchant can tell the difference between counterfeit fraud and lost or stolen, and that is a good question because there's not really a good way for a merchant to know. Um, when the issuer sends in the chargeback, there's certain information that they have to provide um, to show that it's counterfeit or lost or stolen. So work with your processor to understand if they review that information for that chargeback on your behalf and if they work with the issuer, uh, if the information that's provided with the chargeback is not sufficient. A couple of people asking if we can uh, email the presentation. And as Linda said earlier, um, after this presentation is over, it'll be available online. And as well, if you answer the survey, uh, then you will receive the presentation as well. We've got a couple minutes here. Um, somebody again asking if a stolen card is used at the terminal, how does a merchant know that it's stolen? Um, again, you wouldn't know at the time of the transaction. Uh, however, 
when the chargeback is sent, again, the issuer is supposed to send supporting documentation as to why it was lost or stolen or counterfeit. Let's see. Guys, I had some great questions trying to So somebody asked about an EMV card uh, chargeback happens, that they still face the risk of the customer winning the case, uh, even though they did the purchase, and so how to protect themselves. Um, and so that is true. There is still risk um, for a merchant. Again, the best way to protect yourself against the risk um, is to look at the liability shift and to understand um, the liability shift based on your decision as to whether or not to upgrade to EMV. Uh, in most cases, if you upgrade to EMV and there's a chip card used, then you will be protected. So look through the liability shifts again like we just did and identify where your liability exists and make decisions on whether or not you want to upgrade EMV and what you want to support on your EMV terminal, whether it's PIN or signature, uh, and understand what risk those decisions have. And again, remember that the EMV liability shift is only related to lost or stolen or counterfeit disputes, not related to any other disputes. So if the cardholder is disputing the amount of the transaction or disputing that they um, get the services that they asked for, uh, those are different dispute reasons and are not involved in EMV. Somebody asked if EMV is required by the government. Um, it is not. It is not a government mandate. It is not a law. It is not a mandate even by the card brands. Um, it is a choice for the merchant to upgrade to EMV. It is a choice for issuers to issue EMV cards, but there is a liability shift risk. So I think we're close to being at the end of our time. I want to thank everybody for their attendance today and for some great questions. Hopefully the information that we've shared today has been helpful. And again, after this presentation, if you answer the survey that will be sent to you, uh, a copy of the presentation will be made available. Linda, Mark, any closing words? Uh, just Christy, thank you very much for the uh, good information today. And again, thank everybody for um, attending. And as Christy said, you know, answer that short survey. You'll get a link in about an hour or so. Answer that, and it'll be made available. The recording will be posted in about 10 days or so to our YouTube channel. If you have further questions that didn't get answered, please feel free to email us at info at connexus.org, and we'll route those questions to uh, Christy or the appropriate people. So again, thank you, everybody, for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next time.